Good morning, church. Welcome. Like Pastor James said, welcome, especially if you're here for your first time or if you're here for your second time returning back from Easter. So pleased to have you. We literally have had you on our minds and our hearts praying for you throughout this week. You know, I heard a story a few years ago in the news. You might have read the story about this man in China who sued his wife for being ugly. You guys hear that story? And he won. He won. $120,000 and the divorce. Turns out when he married this woman who he thought was beautiful and attractive, he married her. Later on into their marriage, they gave birth to a daughter who he was appalled by at how ugly she was. And he looks at this daughter and he says, oh, that did not come from me. And he starts accusing his wife of infidelity. You cheated on me because no way did that come from me. And so he brings her to court, and it turns out she didn't cheat on him. And she confessed that she actually did have over $100,000 worth of plastic surgery done in South Korea before she got married to him. That's why she looked the way she did when he met her. So he took her to court. The court said, you know what? It's not right to be married under false pretenses. You deserve the settlement. You get the divorce and $120,000. And I know if we go around this room and we survey how you feel about it, I'm sure we'll have different opinions, whether it's justified or not, doesn't matter what you think. According to the court, apparently, the court believes that you shouldn't have to marry under false pretenses and that you should know what you're getting into when it comes to such a, an important and intimate relationship, such a committed relationship, such as marriage. You ought to know what you're getting into. And, and I share that with you because... I, I'm sad to say that I believe many people today, multitudes of people today, may have been misled, deceptively misled into thinking that following Christ is a simple thing. There may be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even more people in this world who, who have walked into this relationship of, with Christ because they've told, been told it's an easy thing. And they think culturally they're Christians when, biblically speaking, they really aren't. They may think that they're saved, but you look at their life according to Scripture, and they may not be. And I believe it's my responsibility as a pastor, and it's our responsibility as a church. When we share the gospel, when we share our faith with people, we got to be upfront with people. we got to share with them the benefit of following Jesus and all the benefits that come with it, but we also need to share the cost. The cost of following Christ. Sometimes it's a high price to pay. And if we don't do that, if we're not faithful to that, what we do is we take the lifeblood out of Christianity. We replace it with Kool-Aid to make it tasty and attractive and appealing to people. And if we do that, that can be tragic. That could be deadly. It could be catastrophic. So I want to share with you guys today what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. In the last weekend... We had a big Easter celebration. How many people were here for Easter last weekend? Amazing. How many people are returning for the second time? This is your second time here at the church. Okay, good. A few, uh, quite a few of you guys are returning back. We're starting off this series today called 364, and it's totally designed to follow up last weekend because we realized that we were going to get a large crowd, and yet as your pastors, we, we resolved that that's not our greatest interest. And as your pastors, we resolved that we're not even interested in seeing a lot of people raise their hands and, and give their lives to Jesus. We're interested in that, but what piques our interest is to see people come and give their lives fully to Jesus, to keep coming back and walking with him on a daily basis. Because Jesus wants way more from us than just one day out of the year. He wants us the other 364 as well. Amen? He wants us every single day. And so in this series, we're going to help you take a look at what it looks like to actually walk with Jesus in this relationship. Today's message I've titled, A Call to Commit. A call to Commit. And I want to show you just a couple aspects of what the Bible says this committed relationship with Jesus looks like. So before we get into that, would you guys bow your head? Would you guys pray with me? And let's come before the Lord. God, I just pray right now that you would... Just really allow us to hear from you. God, I pray that you would speak to every heart and every soul. Lord, I know that there are people who come 
on a regular basis and we sit here on Sundays and sometimes nothing is happening in our hearts. And I pray that that wouldn't be true today. I pray that something would be happening in every heart, whether this is our first time here or our second time here or our 3,000th time here. I pray that something deep and transformational would be happening inside of us. God, I, I pray that you truly would be the Lord of all, that you would be the Lord of every single soul in this place, and that from here, many more people will come to see you as Lord. So, Lord, would you speak to us? Would you speak deep? Keep all the distractions away, everything that Satan may be trying to get us to be thinking about or be, you know, caught up in. I pray that you would just protect this place, protect our hearts and our minds right now. And, God, I pray for myself as I, as I speak. I pray that I would also be listening, just, just the same as everybody else in this room, that we would listen and hear from your Holy Spirit. I pray that everything I say, everything I do, that none of it would be impactful, that none of it would be remembered, that none of it would be powerful unless it's because your Holy Spirit is, is working and speaking and it's, it's uh, our conviction, every one of us, that you are giving us your truth. So Lord, we ask that you would do that. We're desperate for you, God. We need you right now. And so we surrender ourselves to you and it's in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys are going to follow along with me in your notes, in, inside your Baywatch, I have some notes for you. And I want you guys to write this down. This is uh, an aspect of our relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the lover of our souls, and we are called to commit. Jesus is the lover of our souls, and we are called to commit. So, see, the Bible gives us many different analogies of what our relationship with Jesus looks like. And when a very common re relationship or analogy that's given to us is this relationship of a committed marriage, an intimate marriage. For example, Ephesians 5 is one place where we learn that. Verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, a radiant bride, without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. So according to the Bible, we're in this love relationship, this intimate relationship with Jesus. Jesus, the Bible says, is the bridegroom, the church made up of believers. We are the bride. And speaking of Marriage, the, speaking of love relationship, I, I'd love to just introduce you guys to the love of my life. Is that okay? Would you mind if I bring her up on the stage today? Okay. Hey, babe, would you come out here? Thank you. Thank you. I love this woman right here. Some of you guys look scared. Don't worry, she's unarmed. Um, <laughs> that was so dumb. <laughs> You guys are like, Greg, that, that's not your wife. That's a dummy. Don't say that. Don't say that. She hates when people call her that. This is, this is Monakin. Meet Monakin Ma. I love her so much. She's the perfect woman because, you know, I hear a lot of guys complain about their wives and how they nag and they always argue. Monakin never talks back to me. Not once has she talked back to me. She's always wanting to just sit there and listen. Whenever I have something on my chest, I got to get off. She's just willing to listen, doesn't try to solve my problems, doesn't try to make it right. She just sits there and listens. We go to the mall. We go shopping. She never spends my money. How perfect is that? She's perfectly fine just window shopping, preferably from the other side of the window, which is weird to me, but that's, that's okay. That's whatever floats your boat. And you guys are sitting here. You're laughing because this is, this is silly to you. This is a joke to you because intuitively, inherently, you understand that there is no way there is a relationship between us. I can claim to love her, and that may be true. That may be weird, but it may be true. But she can never love me back. And I can talk to her, but she can never talk back. I can commit to her, but she can never commit back. As much as I claim to love her, this is not a two-way relationship. Therefore, it's not a true relationship. You know that. And the same thing with Christ, when he calls us to a relationship with him, don't be a dummy. It's got to be a two-way thing. It's reciprocal. 
Christ commits to us, and he expects us to commit back. He expects a reciprocal relationship. You can come out and take her away. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone say bye to Monica. That's enough of her. But Christ was totally all in and totally committed to you. Look, look what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He went to the extreme for us. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. The king of heaven, who reigned in majesty, stepped down from majesty to humbly take on flesh, to become a servant to all so that you would become spiritually, eternally rich. That's what he did for you. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that God made him, Jesus Christ, who had no sin, become sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He who was perfect, without blame, spotless, he took on sin so that we could become righteous. Guys, remember a couple of weeks ago when we got to reflect on the agony of the cross? Talked about the crucifixion and the, the torture, the excruciating brutality of the cross. Not just the physical brutality, but the wrath of God, the judgment of God that came upon him because he took our sin, the blame for our sin. He was separated, isolated from his very own father. You guys remember that? And so many of us were so moved by, by what Jesus did for us. Brother Ernie was telling me this week that, that as he was sitting there listening and reflecting on what Christ did for us, he was sick to the stomach, literally nauseous because of what Christ went through for us. And yet Christ, when he was in the garden early that morning begging his father, God, take this cup away from me. Do not let this wrath or this judgment fall upon me. He was begging in anguish. Yet at the end of the day, literally at the end of the day, his love was way too intense for us. He was way too committed that he went through with it. Because he knew that if he could just push forward and press through and go to the cross, there would be a joy that he would attain. Look at what Hebrews 12 says. Hebrews 12 verse 2. I love this passage. Because it says, for the joy, circle the word joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There was this joy before him, this joy that he could attain. If he would just press on toward the cross, there would be something on the other side. That joy is you. You were the joy set before him. You are the reason why he endured and pressed through. You are, you are why he was so committed, why he was all in. If he would just take the beating and take the scourging and take the mocking and take the flogging and take the spitting, take the isolation and abandonment from his own father, he would attain you. He went to the extreme. He paid the unpayable price. He suffered what he suffered. He was all in, totally committed in this relationship. And I think he desires the same commitment from us. I think he wants that back. Now I shared... Briefly last week, if you were here for Easter, I shared about how I paid a high price for, for my wife, Monica, my real wife, Monica. And I, I talked about how I, I saved up all this money because at the time we were dating, I was a full-time seminary student. But at the same time, I was trying to work. I worked about 30, 35 hours a week just to make a living. And I, I was told that if I want to marry her, I got to get her a ring. And if I got to get her a ring, I should save up. The guideline was told to me that it was about three months' wages. And I'm thinking, three months' wages? That, that's, that's an arm and a leg for me. Man, that's, I, I don't even make that much in the first place. But, uh, you know, to me, it was worth the cost. So I saved up my money, saved up all this money, designed this ring I thought was a beautiful ring, one that she would love, and I, and I got that ring purchased. And not just that, I... I, I, I tried to put together the most perfect proposal, gathered about 30 or 40 of my friends, spent time and money and energy and effort to put on the perfect proposal. We turned this, this mansion in PV into this restaurant for the two of us. We uh, got some live entertainment, had my friends put together a nine-course meal. 
I learned to play the song in Chinese for Monica. And that may not seem like a big deal, but first of all, I don't sing and I don't speak Chinese. But I sang in Chinese because I wanted her to be my wife. And after months of planning, can you imagine on that day when I finally bring myself together and I get down on my knee and I got my guitar and I'm singing to her in Chinese and I got my diamond ring and I ask her to be my wife. If Monica takes that ring and puts it on her finger and she says, oh my goodness, that's beautiful. Thank you. This is all so awesome. Peace. And she's like out, <laughs> never to be seen again. Like what, what in the world? That would destroy me. And that's why we emphasize that Christ, he, he didn't just suffer what he suffered and pay what he paid. He didn't go to the extreme for us to peace out on him after Easter. He didn't go to the extreme to see us on that Christmas service and then peace out after Christmas. He did all that. He went to the extreme. He was all in, totally committed to have you every single day to be with you in a relationship where he could be the lover of your souls and you would love him back. And I'm speaking to everybody here because there's some of you guys who come faithfully every weekend, every single weekend you're here, and yet Christ paid way too high a price to even have some of you who are just here to meet with him, and you meet with him at most 52 times a year, just on the weekends. You're weekend warriors. You're a Saturday Christian or you're a Sunday Christian. No, he, I'm, I'm speaking to you too. He paid a high price to have you daily. Every single day. We know that in any love relationship, if you've ever experienced marriage, that it is, it is a commitment. And Jesus is the groom, and we are the bride. He is the lover of our souls. But Jesus, Jesus wants our commitment because in marriage, if you've experienced it, you know that there's thick and there's thin. You know there's sickness and there's health. You know there's times when we're richer and when we're poorer. And yet we vow to each other to the day we die, till death do us part, we're sticking it through. And we, Jesus, when you come to Christ, I'm going to be honest with you, there's going to be moments when it's thick and when it's going to be thin. There is going to be sickness, there's going to be cancer, there's going to be death, and there's going to be health. There's going to be times when you're rich and employed, and there may be times when you're poor and unemployed. Yet Jesus is still our Lord and our Savior. He is still the lover of our souls. Amen? And he deserves us. And yet with Jesus, it's not till death do we part. It's actually in death that we finally unite with him like never before in glory forever and ever. This is an eternal relationship with the lover of our souls, and so we're called to commit. Here's the second thing I want to share with you about our relationship with Jesus, if you want to write this down. Jesus is not just the lover of our souls, but he's the Lord of our lives. And we're called to submit. Jesus is the Lord of our lives, and we're called to submit. And before I go on any further, I, I just want to, I don't want anyone to get it twisted. I'm going to put it right out there for you. This is what the Bible says. Make no mistake about it all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the scriptures. But for example, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, here's what the Bible says. For it is by grace. Everyone say grace. grace. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. Everyone say faith. Grace. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Bible says it's not because you read your Bible every day. It's not because you pray. It's not because you go to church and you serve faithfully. It's not because you do community service. It's not because you're a nice person. It's not because you give offering and tithes that you're saved. Those are all works. Those are things that we do. None of those save us. The Bible says clearly it is by faith. Faith has always been, always been, will always be the basis of our salvation. And it's the grace of God. Grace means it's a free gift. He gives it to you when he sees your faith. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. You didn't achieve it. The Bible makes that very clear. But with that being said, let me, let me show you what the Bible also says very clearly throughout the scriptures. Is that though we are saved by faith and faith alone, faith will always, always express itself in a life of obedience 
and submission. That's how you know a faith is true and real. It will always produce obedience. Maybe not perfect obedience right away, but that's, that's our direction. That's what we're striving for. That's what we're moving toward. Obedience. Look what 1 John 2 says. Verse 5 and 6, it says, But if anyone obeys, circle the word obeys, his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. This is how we know for sure you obey and you live it out. Matthew chapter 7, I know Pastor Gary shared this with us last week. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will, circle that phrase, does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So according to the scriptures, though we're saved by faith, a real trusting faith is one that expresses itself in obedience, in, in a life that lives it out in submission. The Bible says that faith, the word there in the Greek is pistos. It can be translated as trust. It can be translated as believing can be translated as faith. We trust, we believe, and we put our faith in Jesus. But what does it mean that we trust Jesus as Lord? It means you obey him. I love uh, this pastor named Francis Chan. You guys may be familiar with him. But he gives this illustration that I always love to steal from him and, and personalize. But imagine my son Evan, who right now is four, but imagine he grows up to be a teenager. And, and Evan's a teenager at home, and I'm at work, and I leave a note on the refrigerator door for him. And I, and I say, Evan, make sure you finish your dinner and then finish your homework afterward. And I, I leave that for him, expecting him to see that because he's always grabbing food from the fridge. A week later, he comes up to me, and he says, Dad, I, I, I read your note, got your instruction. Such a good note. So powerful. And... uh. It was so good that I got together with my friends this past Wednesday night. We got a small group together, and we read it together, just challenged each other, and talked about ways we can actually apply that, how we could go about eating dinner and doing my homework. Oh, I was so refreshed, and I left that place so motivated. It was so good. <laughs> Dad, you're going to love this, but um, I memorized it. <laughs> got it right here in my heart. You said, eat your dinner and finish your homework. I got it. And I'll be like, oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. Glad you saw that. But did you eat your dinner and did you do your homework? What did you do with the instruction I left you? Did you actually live it out? Did you actually respond to it? And I, and I say that because Christians, sometimes we're so good at coming to church or we're so good at studying the word, but we actually have a Lord who expects us to not only hear his instructions, but to actually live it out, to live in submission and obedience. He wants us to do something with what he gives us. Sometimes too often we, we cut the gospel in half because we'll say Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I trust, I believe, I have faith that he's my Lord and Savior. When practically, we have no problem with the Savior part, we love the comforting fact that he died and rose from the dead to save us, but when it comes to trusting Jesus as Lord, that's when few, too many don't live it out. Trusting Jesus as your Lord, what does it mean to actually trust him as your Lord? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary for you of what the word Lord means. Dictionary.com tells us this. It's a person who has authority, control, power over others. A master, a chief, a ruler, a king. That's what a Lord is. And so if you trust, if you truly trust that Jesus isn't just your Savior, that he died and rose for you, to save you, but you trust in him as Lord, you trust that he is your master, your king, your authority, that he has control over you. That means you submit to his lordship. That means you totally and wholly put your weight in him as the Lord of your life. When your master and your Lord says go, you go. When your Lord says stay, you stay. When he says flee, that temptation, you flee. When he says resist, you resist. When he says repent, and you repent. When your Lord says follow me, you follow him. Why? Because you, you trust him. 
And I want to share that with you because sometimes we deceive people in what it means to be a real believer, a real trusting servant in Jesus Christ. I've said this to people before, and I'm sure many of you guys have said the same thing when you're trying to share with people. I've said, hey, you know, it's really about a relationship. Christianity is not about rules and regulations. It's about a relationship. How many of you guys have said that before? And I've said it, and I'll still say it. I hope you still say it, because it really is about a relationship. I just said it's a love-marriage relationship. He's the lover of our souls. But even though it's about the relationship, there's still rules and regulations. And I pray that we don't deceive people when we share about him. All relationships have rules and regulations. Sometimes you call them boundaries. Sometimes you call them guidelines. My marriage with Monica... That's a love relationship, and there are rules and regulations that I abide by every single day. I can't just go dating any woman I want to. I can't just go sleeping around with any woman I want to. I can't just stay out with my boys as long as I want to. I can't spend money on all the things, however much I want to spend on whatever I want, whenever I want to. I can't go surfing for as long as I want anymore. I abide by rules because of my relationship. I can do all those things but it would be in total disregard for Monica. It would be in total disregard of the existence of our relationship. And with Christ, though it's about this relationship, he has given us rules and regulations. You can call them instructions. You can call them commands. You can call them boundaries. You can call them guidelines. You can call them teachings. You can call them counsel. Whatever it is, he expects us to actually live by them, to actually commit and to submit to his words. And we, we, we don't like to say that because sometimes we're afraid that drives people away. Because rules and regulations are too restricting. And, and I pray that you would understand so that you would be able to communicate that to other people. That, that though we have these rules and regulations or these instructions, however you spin it, they're not meant to restrict us. They're actually meant to give us life. They're actually meant to liberate us, to free us from sin and consequences, to live according to the plan and the design that our creator created us to live according to. You'll find that there's actually liberation when you live according to his commands. When I was growing up, my my family, we would sometimes play down at uh, Harbor Park, you know, down by Kaiser Permanente, and there's this lake there. If you've ever been there, there's this big old lake, and I was playing there one day, and my dad was with me, and my dad caught for me two crawdads from that lake. You know what a crawdad is? This is what a crawdad is. And uh, he caught two for me, and I asked him, could we take them home and make them my pet? And, and he said, sure. I don't know if that's legal, but we took them home, and, and I, I got a tank, a, a glass aquarium, and I took a whole bucket of water from the lake with me that day, took some rocks from the park and some plants from the park, and I took it home, and I made these two my pet. Buddy and Pal were their names. (laughs) Buddy and Pal, true story. And uh, I I filled that tank with their water and their rocks and their plants, and for, for days I would just sit there on the living room floor playing with Buddy and Pal. And I would notice that Buddy and Pal would always climb up on the rocks and climb up on the, on the little plants I put in. And they would try to actually break out of that aquarium I set up for them. They would actually try to break free as if this was too restricting for them. And I would pick them up and put them back down, put them back down in their place. Well, about a week later, it was a Sunday afternoon. I came home from church. I was so excited to go play with Buddy and Pal again. And I go, and I'm devastated because Buddy and Pal are not there anymore. Where is Buddy and Pal? And I'm freaking out. I'm looking all over the house, looking for him under the couches. I'm looking everywhere, and Buddy and Pal is nowhere to be seen. I'm absolutely crushed. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, in the corner of my eye, I see some movement over here on the side wall. And I look, and behind the shelf, guess who comes out behind this bookshelf? Buddy. Or it could have been Pal. <laughs> They look the same to me. And so he starts crawling out. And I'm like, before I pick him up and throw him back into the tank, I'm watching to see where he's going to go next. Where is he going to hide now? And guess where he goes? Right back up to the glass of the tank. Starts clawing at the the glass as if you're trying to get back into the water. A few moments after that, I see something else happen over there. Guess who comes out behind the bookshelf now? Pal. Or Buddy. 
And he comes out, and, and before I, I grab him, same thing, see where he goes, crawls right back up to the glass of the tank. And I realize that perhaps they realize it's not so good out here. They were like fish out of the water, fish out of the water, die. Crawdads out of the water, dry up and die, I think. <laughs> Is that true? They probably die. And, and I, I realized that day that they need the water to live, to thrive, to experience the life that the Creator has created them to experience. And in the same way as, as Christians, as people, God has created us with a certain design and plan in mind. He's created us to have this relationship. He's given us guidelines and instructions to live by. And when we live according to plan and according to the Creator's design, we actually thrive. We experience life and life to the full. That's why Jesus said, I came to give you life, life abundantly. Do you trust Jesus as Lord? Not just the Lord of your life, but the Lord of creation. He holds the universe in the palm of his hands. Do you trust that he is all good and all wise and all knowing and all perfect, omniscient and omnipresent? He knows what this world needs. He knows what you need. Do you trust the Lord? Take it from me. It will do you well to trust and obey him because he knows how to give you life and life to the full. It is liberating. Now, with that being said, I want to share with you one more passage in closing. And I, I want to share this with you because this is something our Lord and our Master says. And I have to tell you right now, it is one of the hardest teachings, one of the hardest sayings that Christ has ever given. But he said in Luke 9, 23, he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Would you, would you read that again with me? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny, circle that word deny, themselves, take up their cross daily, circle daily, and follow me, circle the word follow. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Whoever loses their, their earthly and fleshly and worldly life for me will save it for eternity. And the disciples got it when he says you must pick up your cross and follow me. Keep in mind that Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. So they're not thinking about Jesus being crucified. They didn't even know that was coming. But, but they got it because the only people who would pick up their cross in those days were people who were carrying their cross to their own crucifixion. They already knew this is the most brutal and torturous way to die. And so when he says pick up your cross daily, they're getting the metaphor. Because I can't physically go and get crucified every single day. I only die once. But what he is saying is what he said very plainly. That means I have to deny myself. I got to die to myself. I got to crucify my flesh. It means that our Lord and our Master is calling us to lay aside our personal goals, our selfish ambitions, our fleshly desires, so that our Lord and our Master can replace them and reveal to us His goals, His desires, and His ambitions for our life. It's laying my will aside so that now I can live according to my Lord's will. I trust Him. I trust that His will is better than mine. Carrying your cross, crucifying yourself. It means that you must be willing. Here's the hard part. This is what turned people away. You must be willing to sometimes give up your friends, even your family, your comfort, your riches, your career, your job, maybe even your physical life if you want to truly follow the Lord. That is not an easy thing to say and it's not an easy thing to hear. But that's what our Lord and Master is calling us to. Are you willing to, to pay the, that cost? In every heart, in every soul, you have a throne and you have a cross. Picture in your heart right now a throne and a cross, every single one of us. And because you are a finite being, you're a finite person, you can't be on both at the same time. And until you get off the throne and put yourself on the cross and crucify yourself then you are on that throne and you are your own Lord, you are your own master, you are your own chief. You make your own rules and you live by your own will.
But in, unless we, we, if we, if we decide that we're going to step off of that throne and crucify ourselves on the cross, that leaves that throne vacant and allows Christ to now assume that throne. And only then can Christ be our Lord, truly our King and truly our Master. Will you get off the throne? And crucify yourself. This is why Paul writes in Galatians 2, 20. Many people have made this their life verse. I pray that perhaps you will too. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. I trust in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can I, can I translate that for you? He says, I've crucified myself. That doesn't mean he's dead. He's actually the one writing this letter. But I've crucified myself. And I now no longer live. But Christ is my Lord. I trust in Christ, the Son of God. I trust him as Lord. He loved me. He gave himself for me. He's out for my best interest. He's out to give me the best life possible and life abundantly. I trust him and therefore I've crucified myself. And I want to ask you guys, are you willing to do the same? You know, I mentioned Francis Chan earlier, pastor I really admire and love to listen to. And I'll never forget one thing he said. He said one night he was laying in bed, couldn't sleep. He was tossing and turning, and he finally turns over to his wife. He says, babe, he says, you know what I realized? I bet you, you know, because he's a pastor of a mega church, people love to follow him and listen to him. He says, I bet you if Jesus came to town, and he planted a church right next to ours. He says, I bet you mine would be bigger. He says, I bet you if the Apostle Paul came to town and planted right across the street from our church, he says, mine would be bigger. And he didn't say that boastfully. He actually said it regretfully because he realized that all these years of being a pastor, he was always saying the things that everybody wanted to hear. He was saying the things that would attract the crowds to build the biggest church he could build. When he realized his conviction was Jesus, though he had crowds naturally following him, that wasn't his concern. Jesus was concerned about finding true disciples. He was concerned about building authentic relationships. He was concerned about people who were so desperate for life, so desperate for eternal life that they would be willing to lose their lives to find it. And the things he said we're so straight up and so straightforward that people would start filtering out. People would start turning away until only a few were left. He never sugarcoated the sacrifice involved. He never hid the cost of following Jesus. And that's why I feel so important. I know that this message, for, especially for those of you guys who are new or, or just coming for the first time, this isn't the most appealing an attractive and tasty message. But I feel like I need to be straight up and straightforward with you because Jesus was always straight up and straightforward. This is what it looks like to follow me. So I want to ask you, are you willing? Are you willing to carry your cross and die to your own desires and plans? It may not mean that he will take from you your friends and your family and your physical life. He may not take those from you. But would you be willing to for the sake of the call, for the sake of Christ? I want to close by sharing with you a story of a guy named Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott and his four friends made a decision early in their lives to die to themselves, to make Jesus Christ their Lord. There's a strong conviction in their life, and specifically, they felt the call on their lives, and this isn't the call for everybody, but because of seeking the Lord and, and being in this relationship, they felt this burden, this conviction to reach an unreached people called the Alca Indians in Ecuador, South America, because they have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they gave their lives to that. They gave up the American dream. They gave up prestige and career and success because they felt they couldn't escape this call. So they spent years preparing and planning left family to move to South America, spent years pouring into language study, learning foreign languages. And finally, in January of 1956, Jim Elliott and his four missionary friends finally decided it's time for us to fly into the, the tribe 
of the Alka Indians. Alka in the language means savage. It means brutal. Because they were the most vicious and the most violent tribe. They would kill anybody who would come near their territory. They would kill neighboring tribes. They would kill people who were just working nearby. And Jim Elliot and his friends were convinced that the only way they can stop killing people is if they knew Jesus Christ personally. And they experienced the love and the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. And so in order to, to make their way in, they decided to fly in this plane, this small little plane over the tribe before just going straight in because they knew that that would be dangerous. And they would shout out on their amplifier phrases in the Alka language that they learned to show that they're, they're sincere. We come in peace. We, we are friends. They would shout out these phrases in Alka. And then they would drop down buckets of food, buckets of gifts as they flew over just to show that we come to show no harm. And after doing this multiple times, they finally decided it's time for us to land. And they landed on this sandy strip near the river. And as they landed, an Alka man and an Alka woman came from among the jungle, they came. The missionaries are so excited. They came peacefully. They shared a meal together right there on the sand. They ate a meal with them. They even took the man on the plane and flew him around to show him what it looked like from up top. He had never seen a plane before. He called that plane a giant bumblebee. That's what it was to him. And after they built this friendship over this day, they, they told the Alka man and woman, go back and, and bring your friends. Go back and bring the rest of the tribe. We want to share with them good things. We want to share with them friendship. We want to share with them good news. Bring them back. So the man and the woman left. And Jim Elliott and his four friends, they just waited. And they waited. They waited and waited. Two days passed. Nothing happened. Then all of a sudden on January 8th, 1956, all of a sudden two women come from among the jungle. And, and Jim Elliott and his friends jump up with joy. They're stoked. They're pumped. They, they're excited that they finally get to move forward on this mission. And as they run toward these two women to greet them and meet them, all of a sudden from, from, from the jungle emerge a whole tribe of Alka warriors, all armed with spears. And with a loud shout, they come running and charging toward Jim Elliott and his friends. And he had a brief moment to make a decision. He had a gun on him, and he reached down to get his gun in case anything ever happened, in case they had to protect himself. And he had a decision to make. Do I shoot? And do I protect and save our lives? And he decided not to pull the gun. Because Jim Elliott and his friends, they vowed to each other, we will never kill an Alka Indian who does not personally know Jesus. Because we have eternal life. We know Jesus Christ. He's the lover of our souls. And yet, they need to hear that, even if it meant losing our own lives. And in a matter of a few moments, Jim Elliott, Pete Fleming, Roger Udarian, Nate Saint, and Ed McCauley all died for the sake of the call because they were obedient to Christ. See, these, these five men, they made that decision way before that day to die to themselves, to give up themselves, to deny themselves, to follow Christ, and to make Jesus known. Way before they realized that it would actually happen one day. But they had already resolved in their hearts, we, we are crucifying ourselves for the sake of Jesus. And I love this story because later Jim Elliott's journal was recovered. And there's something that he wrote that we know that he lived by. It proved it on that day. But Jim Elliott wrote, you can see it in the red. He wrote this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep, his earthly life, to gain what he cannot lose, eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, are you willing to carry your cross? Are you willing to give up the things of this world and the things of this earth, things that will never last for things that are eternal, things that will never end? An eternity with Jesus Christ, your lover, the lover of your souls, your Lord, and your Savior. And I pray that you will count the cost. I pray that today you would count the cost and you will find, I guarantee you will find that it is well worth the cost. Amen.
I mean, would you bow your heads with me as we pray? And as, as you're bowed, I just want to give you a few moments just to pray or talk to God. I want you to ask him right now, how is it that, that you're calling me to die to myself right now? How are you calling me to deny myself? Maybe it's a, an unhealthy relationship that he's trying to call you out of. Maybe it's, maybe it's a material thing you need to give up. Maybe it's a very selfish ambition. You're living for your own glory and your own fame when he wants you to live for his glory and his fame. What is it, God, you want me to die to? As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to ask you right now, if, if, if you, in your heart right now, want to, want to say, Lord, I, I'm, I'm serious. I want to make you not just my Savior, but I want to make you the Lord of my life. I, I want to die to myself. Whether you're here for the first time or you've been coming all your life, would you raise your hand right where you are so I can just pray over you and pray with you? See, if, Lord, I, I'm, I'm living for you today committing my life to you. I'm all in. I need your help. Would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So good. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray with you. Just pray this with me as, as I pray it out loud. God, thank you so much for loving us so intensely and so deeply that you would give up everything to come down to earth to die on the cross, to rise from the dead so that I could be saved. Thank you for being the lover of my soul. Lord, help me today to walk as a true disciple, one who truly trusts you as my Savior and my Lord. Help me die to myself daily. Every single day, help me to, to deny myself and to ask, Lord, what, what will you have me do today? How can I follow you to make you known in my life, in the life of others? God, I can't do this alone. I'm desperate for you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to help me walk in obedience and in submission to you. And I pray that you will help me to see that it is worth the cost, that this is the best life possible, a life abundantly that you've desired and created for me to experience. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We give our lives to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.